As a man sits down for a business meeting, misery dominates his thoughts. He had co-founded what was going to become one of the most iconic developers and publishers in the history of computer games. But at the moment, their new investors had forced them to jump into console gaming, and it had gone so wrong that they had lost it all. And as he gets ready to give away his company, his life's work, they are interrupted by none other than his co-founder and his best decider, his wife. She's here to fight to keep the dream alive, and she's taking no prisoners. Behind one of the first titans of PC gaming, there is a tale of love, investor greed, and straight-up miracles that led to a series of events that will define the industry for decades to come. This is that story. Brought to you by the Curiosity Stream and Nebula Bundle. Los Angeles, late 70s. A couple of college sweethearts, married at 18, are looking for their fortune in the new and exciting world of computers. Their names are Roberta and Ken Williams. Ken might have been a college dropout, but his skills as a self-thought techie and his ability to learn quickly meant he could climb onto better and better jobs. And with his insistence, Roberta trained as a computer operator and programmer so they could pursue every opportunity in the rapidly expanding LA tech scene. But this rosy life had a little problem. Los Angeles was a bit of a shitty place to live on during the 70s. Hours lost on traffic, drugs and violence. Ah yes, good old LA in the past. Given that the young couple just had their second son, they were eager to move to somewhere a bit less, you know. But computer-related jobs outside the city were very, very rare. How will they ever find employment? But maybe they could create their own. A cottage industry of software developers shipping programs in tapes and discs across the country via mail was brewing up and Ken had the perfect product idea. A big shift in computers was happening, from the big expensive mainframe to what was known as the home computer. A computer for normal, everyday people right in your room. Roberta's Christmas present to Ken in 1977 was an Apple II, one of the world's first highly successful mass-produced microcomputers. Like we all do when we get a new gadget on Christmas, he immediately got it out of its box and started playing with it. And he was almost immediately convinced this was their ticket out. He will create the hottest and most interesting product one could use in a computer. He will create a fucking compiler. Home computers like the Apple II relied on something called BASIC, a high-level programming language that focused on making computers approachable to a general audience. Ken, however, was used to more advanced and optimal languages, frequently present on big boy mainframe computers, such as Fortran. And he was convinced that making a high-performance Fortran compiler for the Apple II was his ticket out of LA, as undoubtedly every programmer will see its value. Every day he will continue to work for other companies and every night he will work on his compiler. But something was about to happen that would throw a wrench into his plans. To still be able to do his day job remotely, he brought home a teletyper. This was long, long before the internet and the way some people would work remotely was by connecting to a mainframe computer via a phone line, using an acoustic modem that will translate data into sound. Evidently this was extremely slow, so this was only for text but it worked. One day, while connected to a remote mainframe, Ken found something unusual. Wait, what is that? It's a game. It's called Colossal Cave Adventure. What? If you're a video game person, you can probably remember a moment like this. The first time you just started playing a game and something just clicked inside you. According to Roberta herself, she would barely do anything else for a month. Any second she was not playing or sleeping, she was thinking about the game. And once it ended, something in her had changed forever. There was a small industry of homebrew adventure games for the Apple II, and she would voraciously consume all she could get her hands on. And it was not long before she asked a key question, can I make my own game for this? And when Roberta really wants something, she will not rest until it happens. I want to make a game. It's a murder mystery, like Agatha Christie's novels where you have to find the killer. While Ken was a bit shocked at the start, it quickly became obvious this was an idea worth exploring. Ken could build the tools necessary for Roberta to make her game, and if he was going to take a short break away from his Fortran business idea, he might as well do it for something interesting. What if we could find a way to add images to the game? Huh? You can do that? Ken almost immediately regretted the suggestion. Uh, to put it into perspective, the floppy disk was one of the most standard units of storage at the time, and it could hold a whooping 110 kilobytes of data. And the Apple II had 64 kilobytes of RAM at best. So getting full pictures in a game was a bit of a memory challenge. But as Ken watched Roberta make a sketch of the game art, 
a light bulb went on his head. Maybe he knew of a tool that could actually solve his problems. This is called a Versa Writer, a mechanical tool meant for drawing graphics in a computer by making points on a grid. What if they could store those points and then have a subroutine draw the lines that connect them instead of storing a whole image? That way, Roberta could make the game art using a Versa Writer and get to store all of it in one floppy disk. Along with that, Ken will create a series of tools so Roberta could write and design the rest of the game. This was way, way before anything that we could consider an engine or game developing tools was commercially available. And the result was what we may consider one of the first utilities for making adventure games, which Roberta immediately put to work to produce Mystery House, a fully fleshed adventure game. But to Ken, this was still another project, a distraction from the Fortran compiler that would allow him to make his own company. In fact, during his visits to the closest computer shop, Ken will often go on about this Apple II Fortran compiler and how it will revolutionize software development in the platform forever to a not particularly fascinated audience. But during one of those visits, he decided to show off this little side project Roberta was working on. The reaction was way more than he expected. Quickly, people gather around the computer fascinated by these text adventures with pictures. Before long, the store owner asked him if Roberta will be interested in selling copies of their games at the store. And only then did Ken finally realize that he had been paying attention to the wrong project to build a company from. Roberta could not have been happier at the reception of the game demo and quickly got busy working on packaging. She will sell the game under Ken's consulting brand, Online Systems, on Ziploc bags with the cover art pasted on top. Crude, but effective. The game sold instantly among the clients of the local PC store. They just could not copy discs fast enough to keep in stock. Before long, every store in the area was calling them asking for copies of the game that they have heard about. And with Roberta hard at work at what they began calling the high-res adventure series of games, this was it. The perfect opportunity. They could make games and sell them to stores via mail. It was time to take their little operations and move into the mountains. Yosemite National Park. This spectacular wonder of nature is by far my favorite thing to visit in California. Oh, okay, fine, second favorite thing. But Yosemite, the Sierra Nevada, the forest, a much better environment to raise a family compared to Los Angeles, or so we'll say, the Williamses. Roberta's parents had retired and both planned to move away from the city in Oakhurst, a tiny city town? census designated place and maybe a perfect place to start a company. The plan was simple. Roberta will make the games and Ken will make the engine, market and ship them to stores around the country. But things moved quickly. Barely a few months in, they needed to get an office and hire people to answer the phone, take orders and package games. And the games quickly improved too. Ken Williams himself would become one of the writers of what was once considered the book on Apple II graphics back in the day. As it explains, high-res mode on the Apple II can only technically produce six colors, but Ken began noticing that extra colors will clearly be generated by blurring together two pixels with different colors next to each other. The technique is known as dithering, and it greatly extended the range of what the Apple II could do. Using this technique knowingly, he was able to add a feature to his drawing tool where Roberta could add color to the art. And this will allow her to create Wizard and the Princess, a fantasy-themed adventure game that, once again, was an enormous hit. Before long, some of the people they have hired to help copy and package the games were approaching them with ideas of their own. Some will be trained as fully-fledged game designers, and soon other game designers from around the country will start sending their games for them to license. The business expanded, and soon they were on their way to becoming a game-releasing powerhouse. But as the company grew, it started catching more attention from some suspicious characters. Most of the stories of this video come from not all fairy tales of happy endings, the full story of Sierra written by Ken Williams himself, and according to him, one day they got a shocking phone call. Yes. May I speak with Roberta and Ken Williams? I represent a venture capitalist firm called TA Associates, and we want to offer $1 million for 20% of your company. Roberta did not like this. She had a bad feeling. But Ken was desperate to progress. Did he want to be the CEO of a bunch of kids in a chaotic office forever? Or did he want to own a real business, to be the CEO of a renowned, prestigious tech company? They were in no lack of money, but Ken's lack of business experience was constantly catching up to him. To have an actual experience board that he could consult and seek guidance on, he could never achieve his dream without this. So, after barely convincing Roberta, they took the money. 
It was at this stage that they realized that they have never formally registered the company and that Online Systems was a name already registered to another company. Taking inspiration on the mountains of the Sierra Nevada that they will see every day, they called themselves Sierra Online. A real company with investors. Investors who desperately wanted their investment to grow in value fast. And they were very eager to use their new influence to push Ken and Roberta towards profitable ideas. Why should they limit themselves to games on home computers? Sierra clearly had the talent, so why not move up to the big leagues? Why make games in the computer market when you could move to game consoles? The computer game industry at the time was nothing compared to the titan of the console industry, Atari. While Atari had initially planned keeping close control of the games made for their Atari 2600, a series of lawsuits with a group of developers that had left them to form their own studio led to them opening the floodgates for external companies to make games for their hugely profitable ecosystem. However, consoles presented some problems. The main one is that no longer will Sierra be able to write games themselves in discs and sell them, Consoles required expensive and limited cartridges that had to be bought in bulk, but the pressure from the investors was unrelenting. They will never grow to be a dominant force in games if they do not move to consoles. So, finally convinced, Sierra spent millions buying Atari cartridges and equipping their offices for console game development. It was not like this could all disappear overnight. Oh, right. In what might be one of the most poorly timed decisions ever made in tech history, the entire game console industry in the US collapsed that very same year. The market in the US was oversaturated with poor quality games, all leading to what many consider the symbolic moment the bubble burst. The launch of the official ET game, which was so poorly reviewed and returned in such high quantities that it started a series of events that will bankrupt Atari. Once considered one of the most promising tech companies in the whole country, overnight, Sierra was left with millions of dollars worth of cartridges and developer kits that were now just paperweights. Looking to salvage something out of this disaster, their investors moved to merge Sierra with another one of their investments, Spinnaker, an educational software company. Roberta and Ken knew that over their next meeting, they would basically be forced to give out their company to someone else. Once the meeting started, their investors were surprised to see Ken alone wearing an ill-fitting suit. He apologized for Roberta being in this post and sat down, too distracted to hear the presentation from Spinnaker. Was this it? The end of his dream of riches? Had he flown too close to the sun and missed his only chance? Good morning! Sorry for being late, everyone. Just give me a second to get some coffee. This was not the attitude anyone expected here. She was far from the nearly bankrupt woman they saw her as. So, what are we talking about? Uh, the management team from Spinnaker is here to talk about their company and see if there's anything we could be doing together. <laughs> that would be a waste of time to discuss. These guys are a joke. No one in the industry respects them. When one of Sierra's investors tried to explain to Roberta and make her understand the delicate situation they were in, something inside her snapped. Oh, she had listened to all of them before. She had enough of things being explained to her. We are not selling our company, and we are definitely not merging with Spinnaker. Ken and I still own 50% of the company, so you need both our signatures, and I am not signing. We are leaving. You coming or what? So now Sierra had a piss off board of investors and no money. But they were not going out without a fight. Because you see, one of the things that was giving Roberta the courage to challenge the board was that she had been working on what she thought was the best game she had ever designed. And she just needed one chance, any chance to get it into the world. They will borrow from every source they could, from personal credit cards and even taking a loan on their home. And then they waited for a miracle. And that miracle will come from the group of people they least expected. A small group of men dressed in suits and carrying briefcases descend on the small town of Oakhurst and head into the offices of Sierra, and the neighbors started gossiping and wondering. While all sorts of rumors and theories about secret federal agencies floated around, in reality, these were none other than high-ranking employees of IBM. IBM was the world's biggest and most serious computer company in the 80s. Their realm was more towards big mainframes and business systems, but the success of home computers like the Apple II had made them reconsider and make a big move towards releasing an affordable home computer of their own, what they called the IBM Personal Computer. And now IBM was working on an entry-level IBM PC called the PC Junior. 
and they wanted to give Sierra a contract to produce an original game for their new system. And more importantly, they were willing to pay royalties in advance to fund the game. That game would be their last hope. And it was called King Quest. If King Quest was to save Sierra, it had to recreate the original elements that made Mystery House successful, a combination of great storytelling and a leapfrogging graphics. In Roberto's head, the natural next step from Color Games was characters moving through a 3D environment. The PC Junior was a significant step up from the Apple II, but true 3D in computers was still beyond the means of the programmers at Sierra. But with the future of the company depending on this one game, a workaround was found. Every 2D scene in the game will be divided into bands. By looking at which band the base of every game object falls into, the engine could tell which one needed to be drawn on top of the other. Essentially, the lower the base of the object, the closer it is to the virtual camera. With the relationship with their investors improving thanks to the big IBM contract, Roberta and Ken scythe with relief. There was a long road ahead, but as long as the PC Junior was not a total disaster, the worst times were probably behind them. And then the PC Junior came out. Fearing that the PC Junior might cannibalize sales on more premium PCs, IBM had taken some very questionable design choices that had crippled the PC Junior at launch. As soon as the first reviews hit, it was obvious that this would be dead on arrival. King Quest was, by all accounts, a masterpiece, but no matter how good the game was, it was of no use if it was attached to a PC that no one wanted to buy. This time, however, the catastrophe did not catch Ken and Roberta by surprise. They had a plan, and another unexpected ally. The US government. While well, IBM poured millions into catching up with the rest of the players in the home computer market, competitors in the space jumped at the opportunity of releasing clones of their machines that, up to a level, were compatible with their software. While well, IBM did pursue some of the companies that directly copied its BIOS, technically, most of their clones were using a reverse engineer BIOS that did not violate their copyright. And also, maybe IBM did not want to press on this issue too hard, because in 1969 the United States government had filed an antitrust lawsuit against IBM, concerned that their hold on the computer industry was bordering on the definition of monopoly. It took almost 13 years for IBM to just barely win the case, but this near-death experience had left IBM executives with a feeling of constant paranoia. And this paranoia led to some bizarre circumstances, including IBM adding a clause to their software contracts, making it super clear that developers could put their software on computers other than IBM. It was like the complete opposite of an exclusivity clause, a uh, please sell your stuff to someone else to prove that we're not a monopoly, please clause. And lucky for Sierra, a certain company called Radio Shack had just released the Tandy 1000, an IBM PC compatible meant to directly compete with the PC Junior, but that fixed most of his major shortcomings. Ken managed to reach an agreement with Radio Shack for King Quest to sell on the Tandy, but that was only the start. IBM PC compatibles were so incredibly successful that IBM PCs slowly became a bit of a default ecosystem, where the IBM part will slowly be forgotten and everyone just started calling the whole ecosystem PC. And with the growing PC user base hungry for games, Sierra was ready to deliver. King Quest will quickly become one of the best-selling games on the whole ecosystem. Their investors were flabbergasted. <laughs> Never in their lives had they seen a company burn out and then rise like a phoenix this way. And for now, peace was settled. Sierra was free to continue pursuing computer games with their support and to maybe aim on becoming the biggest force in all of PC gaming. And that will set them on a path to their own destruction. But that... It's a story for later. Hopefully soon, let me know if you would like to see the next one. However, there's one bit of the story so far that actually deserves a bit more detail. Because right before the Atari fiasco, I mentioned how Sierra was receiving games from other developers to publish, and one of those games had a title that I'm not even sure I can say or put in YouTube without the video getting age-restricted. It was an adventure game with a more adult theme that was sure to get some interesting attention, so to promote it, Ken and Roberta will start a series of events in Sierra that will lead to some pretty interesting shenanigans. Again, I'm not even sure I can mention in detail. So that is the story that I chose for this episode of SideQuest, my exclusive series expanding on side stories connected to the main video. So if the main video is about the iPod, the SideQuest is about that one time Apple did a small favor to the US government to modify an iPod for some unknown project, or this time around the story of probably one of the most spiciest game covers Sierra ever made. 
And thankfully, I don't have to worry about YouTube's age restriction on that, because SideQuest is exclusive to my streaming service, Nebula. Nebula is a creator-owned service where a growing collective of creators upload our exclusive content and our usual content early and ad-free. And viewers of this channel in Nebula are the ones making it possible for me to hire voice actors and artists and all the other elements that make these videos better. 